Thanks very much, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here. A great conference. Uh, looking forward to learning more as the afternoon progresses. These two studies, Covent and Attract, have revolutionized how we think about DVT. And uh, hopefully I can give you a glimpse of them, but there's a lot more to these studies, and I encourage you to look at the original publications for further uh, elucidation. So catheter-directed thrombolysis went from, in the 1990s, three to four days of dripping with urokinase and streptokinase, and then eventually TPA, to a more uh, sort of single session approach, one day sort of infusion. We lowered a couple things. First, the dosing per hour, and also the amount of heparin that was given concomitantly, and actually lowered the bleeding rates with this. Um, by the mid to late 2000s, we discovered this technique called pharmacomechanical catheter-directed thrombolysis. And the idea behind this is that you you could complete as much as you could in a single session and perhaps be done rather than infusing uh, TPA or whatever litigate you, you would choose over the course of two to three days. This allowed for shorter infusion times, more convenience, lower bleeding rates. So this is what was considered modern uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis when you use these tools that both mechanically removed thrombus and, were, and administered some sort of thrombolytic. So when we talk about when do we escalate therapy beyond anticoagulation for DVTs, it's really about a risk-benefit situation. Pa patients with phlegmasia, we would routinely do this, even if their bleeding risk is moderate, as seen in this uh, second column. Uh, but the, the question that most of us face is in this set of patients, patients with iliofemoral DVT and femoropopliteal DVT, sort of garden variety that, you know, doesn't feel good, but is not at the level of phlegmasia. Should we be routinely using catheter-directed thrombolysis for these patients? And that was the focus of several studies, the Covent and Attract trial. Just to clarify what this means, iliofemoral DVT is anything from the iliac and common femoral, and then femoropopliteal refers to anything in the, what used to be known as the superficial femoral, now the femoral vein, down into the popliteal vein. And the reason that we uh, distinguish these two is that the risk of the post-thrombotic syndrome actually is much higher with iliofemoral DVT than it is with femoropopliteal DVT because it is the final common pathway from the leg. So this is what you could call the face of the post-thrombotic syndrome. It's an awful, awful condition. And fortunately, this only happens in a minority of patients. But when it does, it's debilitating and very expensive. So this is uh, hyperpigmentation, uh, induration, edema. This is a healed ulcer. So in the SEEP classification, this would be a C5 patient. But this patient actually was in a wheelchair. That's how bad this was for him. If we think about the epidemiology of the post-thrombotic syndrome, which was alluded to by Rob, 50 to 300,000 Americans will develop this condition per year. If you take 250 to 600,000 DVTs per year, 25 to 50% developing PTS, that's where this number comes from. Very expensive disease. <clears throat> Okay, so in the early 2010s, the Covent study finally came out, and this was really the first randomized controlled trial looking at whether catheter-directed thrombolysis could reduce the rate of the post-thrombotic syndrome. So its study design was that it was including patients 18 to 75 years of age, onset of symptoms within three weeks, <clears throat> objectively verified DVT localizing the upper half of the thigh, so the upper femoral vein or the common iliac vein or combined iliofemoral segment. Um, this, this study had 209 patients included, 100 were allocated to CDT and 100 to standard treatment. And in the final analysis, the intention to treat analysis, this is the numbers that they had, 90 and 99. So relatively small study, but still the biggest randomized multicenter study we had at the time. Um, you look at these baseline characteristics, it's important to note that as there were more patients actually with just femoral deep vein thrombosis than iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis. So it was not enriched for iliofemoral disease, just as the ATTRACT trial was not. And that is honestly a, a bit of a limitation for both these studies based on the epidemiology I just showed you. <clears throat> What did the Covent trial show? It actually did show a statistically significant reduction in the post-thrombotic syndrome at two years. So there was an absolute risk reduction of 14% in those who underwent catheter-directed thrombolysis. Now keep in mind, this was an infusion-only study. So they basically placed an infusion catheter and let the, let the thrombolytic drip for about, on average, one to two days. They did use stents as needed, but their stenting rate was relatively low. So that was criticized in the study, but there's no clear evidence that more stenting would have improved these outcomes. Nevertheless, this was a positive study based on their primary endpoint. 
So this sort of set the stage for the ATTRACT trial, which is a much larger trial than the Covent study. It was a, it is a, it was a prospective, randomized, single-blinded phase three clinical trial, multi-center, 50 sites across the country. Almost 700 patients were enrolled in this study, and it used those modern techniques I alluded to earlier, the single-session PCDT. The primary measure was the post-thrombotic syndrome, as measured by the Volalta scale at two years, and this was an NHLBI study. <clears throat> The PI for the study is Suresh Vedantam. So basically, a patient who comes in with an acute DVT is randomized to either receive anticoagulation and compression, or those two plus adjunctive pharmacomechanical catheter thrombolysis. And assessments were at 10, 36 months, one year, 18 months, and 24 months, the final assessment being the primary endpoint with the Volalta scale, which is a measure of the post-thrombotic syndrome. The angiojet was one tool. The trellis, which no longer is being manufactured, is this was the second tool. Uh, we ended up enrolling 16 patients into the angiojet arm when I was at Cornell. Uh, this is what the trellis device looked like inside the body. Uh, sort of historical now. Uh, this is the infusion catheter that was referred to earlier. So these are two radio opaque markers, and you have multiple infusion side holes along the length of it between these side holes. And then this end hole occluder makes sure that all of the lytic goes between those markers. <clears throat> also, we're allowed to use balloons and stents adjunctively. So I'll go right to the results since I'm running out of time. Um, basically, uh, these were the short-term effects of PCDT, and overall they were positive. You know, leg pain was better in the PCDT group than the no PCDT group. The uh, pain and the swelling was lower in the PCDT group. As expected, this is something we all see in clinical practice. The bleeding was higher as expected in the PCDT group, but this is probably the lowest rate of bleeding that we have found in any thrombolytic study. There were no fatal or intracranial bleeds, importantly. When we look at the primary endpoint, unlike the Cavent study, there was no difference in the rate of PTS uh, at, two, at two years. There was some intriguing data when it came to moderate and severe PTS, and these curves tend to separate between iliofemoral and femoropopliteal DVT. So if you look at that more closely, femoropopliteal DVT, PCDT basically did nothing for these patients from, on, on any sort of measure, including uh, improving patients with moderate or severe PTS. On the other hand, patients with iliofemoral DVT, there seemed to be some benefit to reducing the rate of moderate to severe PD, uh, PTS if you underwent PCDT. <clears throat> So then for us as interventionalists, we were quite surprised by this. And so why did this happen? Well, I mean, one, was there a difference in relevant parameters? Not really. There, these were all consistent between the two groups. Yes, more patients were lost to follow-up, but sensitivity analysis did not really change these findings. Venography showed that it was actually pretty technically successful, so we can't attribute this to technical failure. And I think if, when I spoke to Suresh about this, basically what we're usually referred the sickest patients, and that's what we see, and that's what we see in Improve. That was not the design of the ATTRACT trial. This was all comers with proximal DVT entering this trial. Um, <clears throat> for time's sake, I'll go to the last slide, which is where do we go from here? I think ATTRACT and CAVENT are actually concordant in terms of describing iliofemoral DVT and the benefit that might be derived. It's confirmed what we have seen epidemiologically, and I think the future is to focus on safe and cost-effective strategies to remove thrombus in patients with iliofemoral DVT. Thank you. <clears throat>